Uh, uh, worked on this, uh, and uh, that problem was uh, solved. Uh, uh, then, uh, the, I guess you, you went, went on to still other problems. That, uh, well, uh, Robert Oppenheimer said, uh, you know, we, oh, I guess I went to him and said, look, Robert, I'd like to have a new job. I'm through with my old one. I'd like to have a new job that would get me overseas. I had been overseas in the European theater with radar, and I thought it would be interesting to get out into the Pacific. So he said, well, as a matter of fact, we have a job that I think just fits you. Because normally when you develop a new weapon, like a new bomb or anything of that sort, new rifle shell, you take it out to Aberdeen test testing grounds and you test it and test yeah. it and test it, learn all about it, you learn how well it shoots and how much energy it releases. That we haven't got as many test devices yeah. to shoot to do that kind of a program. So we're going to have to take the proving grounds over enemy territory, make the make the tests when the bombs are dropped in combat. So he said, Will you figure out some way to measure the yield of the bombs that we drop on Japan? So I figured out a way to do using the acoustic method. We eventually, very quickly, I should say, very quickly designed and built uh, pressure measuring devices which could be dropped out of an accompanying airplane on parachutes, which would then stay, essentially put drops dropping slowly as the two airplanes made approximately 180 degree turns to, quote, get the hell out, unquote. And then the acoustic sensor pressure measuring device in the parachute cages would then radio the signals back to the airplane where they'd be recorded on cathode ray tubes. So you got uh, you got a recording of the response. We got the recording. Uh, the, uh, well, we got pressure versus time curve and And then using the theory and knowing the distances and the altitudes, you could calculate the pressure. Now the difficulty with this is that nobody paid a speck of attention to our measurements because before we had a chance to reduce our measurements, President Truman announced that the yield of the bomb was 20,000 tons of TNT. That was uh, one of the projected uh, uh, yields, and he didn't know that. He just thought that was a number, and so he released that, and for, I don't know, 25 years, that was the quote, standard, unquote, yield of the Hiroshima bomb. But oh, yeah. people at Los Alamos couldn't make those numbers agree with what they measured in Hiroshima, the, the intensity of the burning... and the various other indicators of pressure that they had made it look like it was somewhat less. Oh, yeah. So somebody remembered that we'd made some measurements, and I got started getting letters from Los Alamos saying, could we see your records? They didn't even have our records. I had them in my personal file. So I made Xerox copies of them sent them to Los Alamos, and they analyzed them and said, well, it looks more like 13 kilotons, and that is now the accepted number now being used in place of the old standard 20 kilotons as the Hiroshima number. Yes, well, I find that that's No, he, he didn't tell us uh, quite uh, the the end of that story. That that, that the whole measurements good. So I'm glad to get that additional piece.
piece of information. Well, that uh, that is a, 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 a fascinating uh, Incidentally, uh, one of the things I've heard is that, uh, and I'd like to have you uh, just make at least a brief mention of it, is that uh, your idea of trying to get a message uh, uh, to the uh, to the emperor through one of these parachutes, and I'm not sure how. Uh, whether this is apocryphal or or, uh, or how much fact and, uh, there is to No, it's an absolutely true story. Uh, uh, Harold Agnew and I, as he probably told you, flew over Hiroshima, but neither of us flew over Nagasaki. But the same were in the airplane that accompanied the uh, bomb dropping airplane to Nagasaki. Oh, yes. And uh, Larry Johnson, as I mentioned, mentioned earlier. Our sergeants from the Los Alamos, who are in the plane and dropped the gauges and got the measurements. So we got a good measurement over Nagasaki as well. Oh, yeah. I didn't go along, and Harold didn't go. interesting to get a message to the Japanese high command and so I sat down and wrote a letter out longhand to my friend uh, Dr. Sagani who was at the University of Tokyo and who had spent a year and a half or so in Berkeley before the war to Dr. Rikichi Sagani from the of your former comes at the Berkeley Radiation Laboratory. I had most of the signed our names, but at least there were three of us instead of just one. Oh, yeah. I wrote the thing out by hand, and they approved it, and uh, then we made uh, uh, carbon copies. In fact, when I, I wrote the original letter, I made two carbon copies, and we put them in envelopes and take them on to the, the and they were dropped out over Nagasaki. 
Okay. Oh, yeah. I have actually seen the uh, report of a naval officer who, who uh, opened those envelopes, who uh, probed around in the uh, pressure gauges and bought parachutes. Oh, yes. I so, so he must have thought that there was a good chance that he was <laughs> probing around with a atomic bomb. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a fast. Of course, I uh, I guess the fact that those instruments were uh, dropped by Paris. Yeah. of the instruments, it was just that the parachutes were seen yes. coming down. Oh, yeah. The interesting thing there is that I have in my files at home both one of the letters that went down in Nagasaki. Oh, yeah. I sent him a full set of physical reviews from the whole war period. Oh, yeah. I had to do that. The intercourse between the Americans and the Japanese in the field of physics, you know, he destroyed the... Uh, 60 Yes, I remember that. So I got by a kind of a circuitous route, and uh, as a favor in return, Sigani sent me the letter. Compton's brother, Wilson Compton, who was then president of uh, uh, Washington State College. Sagani wrote President Compton a letter asking if he would give this letter to me, which President Compton did at halftime during a football game here at Cal Stadium when Washington State College was playing Cal. had an appointment to meet uh, Wilson Compton. He gave me the letter. So I have the letter in my files, the one that actually came down. I also have the pressure gauge. Yes, that's uh, fascinating. Now, incidentally, uh, uh, there are there copies of the letter in any of the art? There was an article about it by uh, Lowell Thomas in the uh, uh, um, time. It was entitled "Under Separate Cover: One Atomic Bomb." Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that's probably important is that uh, I learned that that letter did get to the high command. Essentially, immediately.
say whether that had anything to do with it. I don't know, but I, I like to think it did. Yes, well, that's a, uh, I think that's a, a, a story which is uh, a Certainly delighted and uh, able to get the first hand story from you. I had another one there, which is interesting. Talking about that period. On the way back from uh, Hiroshima to uh, uh, Tinian, I wrote a long letter to my son, who at that time. Telling him about my experiences and what it's like to go into combat for the first time. It's a fairly personal letter. Oh yes, well that's a that's a really uh, uh, touching thing there. Uh, 